Good morning. It's still uh, morning, right? It's uh, 11.15 right now. It's almost 11.15. I would like to welcome you to this session about Libyan transition. And we have great, uh, two great guests and, and great uh, commentators, too. Hopefully, he will chime in. And, uh, and we'll, be, uh, we'll be in good shape. Uh, of course, uh, all of us have been following what's been going on in Libya for a while, um, wondering about what kind of transition that we... Uh, uh, that we are witnessing and how will Libya fare in uh, the next couple of uh, years. Uh, we are witnessing what's going in, in Libya with a great uh, hope for the future, but also uh, a lot of concerns, um, security issues, uh, economic issues, governance issues, uh, conflict within Libya itself, uh, the um, regional uh, security issues also are of a very good uh, importance. Uh, importance to, to Libyans and to the rest of the world. Uh, today we'll be able to hopefully we'll shed some light on the issues trans transition in Libya. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Isama Mesh, he is the uh, chairman of the uh, Libyan Emergency Task Force that was very much involved in the issues of uh, lobbying for uh, Libya in uh, the United States during the conflict, during the uprising and the revolution. He will uh, share his uh, uh, his uh, views and comments on the transition, how is it going, uh, how it's uh, sparing, and also will be followed by uh, uh, Hafez Ghuel. Uh, Mr. Ghuel is an advisor in the World Bank. Uh, he will be giving his uh, insights and critiques to what's going on, the issues of legitimacy of the government, and so on and so forth. Hopefully we'll have some comments also from a distinguished guest, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mazen, uh, Kar Kar Karim Mezran, I always call him Mazen, Karim Mezran. Hopefully he'll, uh, he's with the uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University, and uh, he will be chiming in with some of the uh, insights. So without uh, any delay, I would like to invite uh, Isam, Dr. Isam Omesh uh, to uh, start uh, the conversation. It's a conversation, so feel free, I think, to, uh, to uh, ask <coughs> questions or interject if Isam would like that. I don't mind at all. Isam. Allow me to sit, if you may so that I can have my comments. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for participating in this uh, timely uh, program. And I think it's, uh, I, I want to extend my thanks to Dr. Paul Rich and the uh, Policy Studies Organization for arranging this uh, Middle East dialogue. Uh, certainly the Arab Spring and, and, and the events that are taking place in the, in the area are worthy of attention and, and uh, having the opportunities to uh, look into these is, is uh, always very helpful. And Libya particularly uh, has been uh, one of the uh, areas where much has happened and uh, we are in great need for uh, a perspective on what's going on in Libya. So this session talking about the transition in Libya and the road ahead um, you know, comes at, in, the, in, the, in the heel of the anniversary, the first anniversary of the revolution, uh, which was just uh, uh, passed. And I think it's exactly the time for us to focus on something uh, of that uh, importance. It has been a uh, monumental year. Um, a well-entrenched dictatorship has been <laughs> dismantled. Uh, the world community has come together to uh, bring forth a change that, that uh, you know, for the first time, the UN uh, implements its uh, mandates in the right to protect. It took an international coalition, it took uh, Arab leadership, as well as, and above all, it took the strength and the bravery of the Libyan people, who have sacrificed over 50,000 martyrs, who have uh, endured a, uh, a very difficult year, uh, and one that continues to exact uh, heavy tolls in, in the injured and the disabled, as well as in the uh, state or the status where the country is today. But the fact of the matter is that it is the post-revolution phase that while the revolution itself may have been very costly and, and very difficult, um, but, but the real challenge begins when, when the dust settles. And when we are looking at Libya today, uh, you know, in the post-revolution phase, uh, we need to garner just as much support, if not more, and we need to get everybody who has been part of the huge change in Libya to continue uh, to pursue their involvement in order to see Libya through that very difficult transition phase. Transition phases are difficult by their nature. 
uh, state building is not, is not easy and, and uh, especially complicated in Libya by a legacy of 42 years of, uh, of destruction and 42 years of holding back uh, the uh, aspirations of the Libyan people and their ability to build their own state institutions. Um, recently, the uh, Minister of Strategic Planning and Development in uh, Libya, just two days ago, Dr. Issa Twajer, was being interviewed in Al Jazeera, and he was asked uh, about what their assessment is of the challenges that are facing them. And the first point he highlighted was the legacy of the 42 years, and he said it's a legacy that has impacted even the mindset of the Libyan person. It has impacted the mindset of the Libyans as a people, and it has held them back for so long that in order to transform the very important essential uh, uh, agent of change, if you may, in the Libyan uh, uh, construct is, in fact, the, the, the Libyan individual. And, and, and he's very right in that. And in addition to the other legacies that have come with it, the political legacy of essentially no uh, vibrant political institutions and no environment uh, to allow for the, for the expression and the uh, translation of the aspirations of the Libyan people, and certainly the economic uh, 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 legacy of, of an elimination of a private sector, of a, of a dependency on a, on a single commodity, not being able to uh, start on a, on, a, on a strong footing in a phase that is very critical uh, and, and one that's marred by, by, by very serious challenges. So today as we engage this discussion, and this group is a well-informed group of the Libyan matter, so hopefully we can again make this more of a discussion, but let us highlight some of the challenges that we see as paramount in the transition of the Libyan people, and let us at the same time look for the opportunity that these challenges present. I mean, I think, I think you, could, you could be either overly optimistic or overly pessimistic if you look at different angles, but a balanced view is exactly what we need uh, to do. It is a, a, a cautious optimism. It is one that braces itself uh, in the reality, but it's also one that aspires for the great potential that the Libyan situation affords us. And I hope, inshallah, God willing, that we can see through uh, these changes. And so when we categorize these challenges, I'd like to put them in, in six categories so that we at least can focus and, and direct some of our discussion. And I'm sure there will be other outlying you know, issues that can be raised and can be incorporated as we uh, uh, bring forth these, these points. But uh, by doing so, I'd like for us to uh, develop a perspective on how we can look at this wholesome picture, identify these challenges, yet also look into the potential opportunity that exists within these uh, uh, challenges, and then bring, you know, bring it back to, to the ground and to the reality that we live in and see what is it that can be done. Ultimately, you know, uh, we, can, we can assess, but if we don't uh, we're not able to afford uh, effective solutions, we don't get very far. There's no doubt about the fact that on top of the list of, of the challenges that we face today is the issue of security and, 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 uh, and uh, achieving the peace in Libya. And that's been manifested in, in several conflicts. There's very specific factors to it. The revolution of the Libyan people was spontaneous, was led by the average person in the street but it was also something that has affected the, the, the Libyan psyche in a very significant way. I mean, this is a youth, you know, the main sector that actually made the revolution happen was the sector of the very youth that grew under the uh, rule of, of Gaddafi. And those young men have gotten to a point where they've literally lost hope in seeing any viable future for them in Libya. They have seen the state rob them practically of everything that they have and they own. And so for them, it was all about regaining all that lost sense of uh, hope and, and future. And nobody will actually give that up once they have gotten that in their hands. So the, 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 the rapid growth of militias, and, and in some estimates there's over 200 militias, enlisting anywhere between 120,000 in conservative estimates to over 200,000. But those are the very youth who have given up their lives, and they're the very youth who have paid the heavy price of the revolution. And for them to be decommissioned and, 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 and for these militias to be de demobilized, it's not going to be an easy uh, challenge. We have a government that is unable to, has, as of yet, 
put a national army that, that, that can have the command structure and that can have the basis by which it can be the venue through which security is achieved in, in, in the country. You have these freedom fighters that need to be integrated back into civil society and into, into the, the institutions and be given the opportunity whether to be in the part of the police force or part of the army or even be afforded opportunities of economic opportunity and educational opportunities so that they can put down their arms and re-engage back again uh, civic society. And above all, you have a sovereign state that is in a very difficult situation. It's unable to even secure its own borders. We have heard and seen what has happened recently with Kufra and, and, and the challenges that these things pose, and we have a nation that is being threatened by the lack of security and the inability to afford a, uh, a stance in that, in that uh, perspective. So that, that's, that's one big category that will need to be looked upon, uh, into, and, and, and we need to figure out ways to uh, 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 mitigate the, the, the challenges that uh, arise from, from that. The other challenge, I, I believe, is in the governor's challenge. This is a nation that, again, does not have any significant, well-established political culture. We don't have governmental institutions that can allow for a smoother transition. We have dismantled a regime that has essentially dominated the, 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 the political uh, uh, space in, in the entire of Libya. And so you're, you're not only getting rid of a legacy and, and, and trying to move forward, but you don't have much to stand on as well. And that you know, poses a very difficult challenge. We've seen it in the, in the in remarkable journey of the NTC, the National Transitional Council. I mean, the incredible sense of unity and the ability for, for, for the Libyans to come uh, behind a, a, a leadership from within the heart of the revolution was inspiring. But now it's, it's, not, it's no longer good enough for a, a, a state of transition. It is no longer good enough for a, a nation that is building its own structure to be representative, democratic, under the rule of law, and able to respond to uh, all the demands of the international community. So we see it. We see it in the Libyan uh, context in the lack of definition between the roles of the current government in, in charge and the, the existing National Transitional Council. We see it in the fact that we have a government that is unfortunately marred by its inability to be very effective in conducting its own plans and strategies. We see it in their own performance, and, and we need to be somewhat critical as well of, of them when, when there is no... A clear guiding uh, documents that, 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 that documents the relationship between the, the two biggest you know, uh, author, uh, authority uh, bodies in the country. We don't have clear strategic priorities that the government is able to uh, articulate and able, uh, able to uh, 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 bring forth to the, to the Libyan audience. So there's a very serious challenge, one of capacity possibly, but also one of leadership and one of uh, the need for uh, a, a strong governor's uh, structure. The third category that I would classify some of the challenges facing us and, and, and being a critical issue of the transition is the whole issue of recon national reconciliation and the transitional justice system, whether it's because of the lack of strong uh, judicial uh, instruments and, 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 the, and the inability to uh, uh, affect significant processes in place to be able to produce ultimate results, uh, or whether it's the magnitude of the problem itself. This is a country that has been, uh, it's been the legacy of the, of the, of the former regime to divide and, 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 and create the animosities and build these ticking time bombs that are now being faced, whether it's the, the tribal uh, allegiances or whether it's the regional conflicts that are existing. And a revolution that has been as bloody as the Libyan one has, uh, has you know, left a lot of pain and a lot of suffering and a lot of uh, bad blood, if you may, that is the, the, the very fuel of a potential uh, uh, national strife and, and, and civil uh, uh, war. And so we can't underestimate the problem, we can't ignore the problem, and there's manifestations that we see today, again, in the absence of uh, the rule of law and in the absence of strong judicial uh, institutions, you, do, you will have excesses. You will have excesses in the best of, in, in, the, in, the, in, in revolutions that even may have all these, in, you, you still have excesses, let alone in a, in, a, in a state where it's not. So for us to not pay attention to this issue and not work very hard to, to, uh, to, to deal with it, I think has been one of, the, one of the shortcomings of the leadership 
in Libya today, and it's something that is vitally important that we pay attention to it immediately and put the institutions necessary. And, and we can learn from the models in South Africa and other places, but we've got to you know, frame and, and create maybe our own version of it. No doubt there is, there is a lot of special uh, uh, things that, that, that are you know, relevant to the Libyan context, whether it's its tribal structure, whether it's religious background, or whether it's you know, set up, but it, but it has to come up with strong leadership, with the utilization of all the potential uh, 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 leaders that are out there that would help you know, tribal leaders, religious leaders, and, and the likes. And we have to make sure that the government deals directly with the challenges that are, you know, human rights abuses, you know, the, 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 the searing reports of, uh, of Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. I mean, these are unacceptable excesses, irrespective of the status that the country is in and what's happening between Musrata and Tawurga and things like this, or the, the, if, if you made the dismal performance handling the, the safe uh, trial and, and the need to engage the international court, uh, criminal court, all these issues give nobody an excuse not to uh, put those in the forefront and make sure to close the gap. The fourth uh, challenge is one of economic revitalization and the uh, restructure, I mean, rebuilding of Libya. You know, Libya has been blessed by, by significant resources, uh, and Libya is a relatively small uh, country uh, with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with needs that are arguably manageable, given the resources and given the size of the population and, 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 and where the country is today. But unless and until you put these policies in place and unless you have leadership that is able to, uh, to, to mobilize the political will and capital to, to institute these changes, and unless we have effective mechanisms to minimize the impact of the legacy, whether it's the corruption or whether it's the inefficient bureaucracy or whether it's the, the lack of, of, of uh, you know, uh, planning along those lines, we have to be able to create the right environment for that because no political success will be uh, sustained if you don't have economic revitalization and you don't have rebuilding efforts and the reinstitution of basic services and things along those lines. So I think that's a huge challenge that needs to be uh, uh, prioritized and given all the, and, and, and recognize that it, it may be, but again, it's all about making sure that these are effective, implementable and sustainable solutions, not just wishes. And, and, and when we you know, cry foul that the f assets have not been unfrozen and, and there is no money and things, well, what, what is there to, to help you know, move forward? The, the, the most recent report from IMF was, and I don't want to take away from the, my dear expert, uh, my, uh, Mr. Hafad, but the idea is you know, IMF's report, you know, Libya's uh, income this year is, uh, or in two, uh, projected is, is about 50 billion. There's a deficit already of about 10 billion. Uh, because of what's going on. But if you think about it, with, with, with strong leadership and with, with correct policies, I'm sure there's plenty of potential for us um, to move forward uh, regarding this. And, and w whether we prioritize foreign investment versus uh, the provisions of basic services or whether we you know, uh, are able to uh, optimize the, the, uh, the income from the oil sector and from the revenues that are coming, uh, managing uh, the investment assets that are outside, all these issues will eventually need to be put through an integrated plan that will produce results and bring forth the changes that are necessary uh, in Libya. Um, the fifth challenge that I, I highlighted is that of uh, the need for us to sustain and nurture the nascent civil society uh, growth that is happening in Libya. and. Likewise, or, or parallel to that, or along with that, is the nurturing of a healthy political process in Libya that is able to uh, engage this change and, and become really the safeguard for uh, maintaining those, those successes and, and building uh, forward in them. And there's plenty that can go under that topic. We can certainly look at the role of media and, and role of, again, civil society and the role of, of, of uh, uh, the, 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 the true movers and shakers in, in, in Libyan society, the, the sector of women and the sector of youth and the need for us to invest heavily in those uh, 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 very important sectors because ultimately the future in Libya uh, or of Libya depends on the strength and the healthiness of, of uh, 
of those uh, institutions, we have to take uh, 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 or learn some lessons from the current experience in, in Egypt, possibly, about the role of the internationals and the international institutions while we encourage it and appreciate it. And we think it's very important for democratic nations and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, those who are invested in seeing a bright future for Libya to engage and, and to involve, but to make sure that this is done through Libyans and through folks who are uh, uh, very much invested in their own development of their own society and of their own uh, country. And the last part that I would uh, um, uh, focus on is uh, the, essentially the roadmap and the challenges that are you know, coming with it. We have an election process that has been in motion. Uh, we have uh, an upcoming national council that is, uh, that is to be elected. Uh, we, we have a process that is in motion, um, and, and we can highlight that process quickly, but the idea, of course, is Come the elections in June of 2012, there is the election of a 200-member National Council, which will take upon itself the, uh, not only the, 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 uh, the, the supervision and the overseeing of a, a new government that will be put in place also to, to, uh, to continue to manage the uh, uh, affairs of the society, but also to establish a constitutional committee that will draft a constitution that has to be approved by the National Council and then subsequently subjected to a referendum that will be a national referendum that needs to garner two-thirds of the, of the approval uh, votes of, of the Libyan people. And, then, but, and that constitution will set the framework for the future of Libya, whether it's its governor's structure, whether it's electoral process, and the establishment of a parliament, and subsequently, of course, the establishment of a government. That is coming subsequently. If you add the months, you've got a 60-day period for the constitutional uh, uh, committee to establish itself, another 30 days for them to be able to get the national referendum in place. So that's a minimum of three months. And then once that, uh, that the constitution is approved, you've got the provisions of about a six-month period where the national elections will be set up, where a, the ultimate final parliament will be put in place. So you're talking at, at least a year, uh, plus minus, um, and, and then you've got also the challenge of once that parliament is instituted, you know, the, it, the, the, the setup and the structure, that's all going to be part of the constitutional process. But ultimately, how are you going to lead the country beyond, you know, and, and, and of, officially uh, end or close the, this transition period? Transition periods are not easy. This time frame that we have locked ourselves in is actually a very significantly strenuous uh, time frame. Some people, uh, some experts don't even think that it's viable nor is it doable. Nonetheless, it's being implemented. So the challenges of how to, to bring that forth, we saw that in the uh, recent law of the elections and how people wrestled as to, you know, which way, uh, which processes are to be utilized. Is it the direct vote? Is it the one with the lists and the political parties? And then, of course, you don't have very efficient or very effective political parties. Uh, if you leave it to the one-person vote, then you get a the, you know, the, 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 the dominant force will be the tribes and the regions, and that could help further divide the country, and maybe even the, those who have, uh, you know, uh, un, uh, unaccounted for wealth can use it to, to taint the political process. I mean, plenty of challenges, even the polling, the districting, the idea of how we're going to conduct this vote, mm -hmm. certainly a big challenge and one that requires international partners, UN and other folks, to be, uh, uh, to be health, uh, you know, engaged in a, in a very healthy manner to be able to affect those changes. So if you look at that whole list of uh, things, then you recognize the magnitude of, of the challenges that are still facing Libya. And this is all in addition to, you know, like I said, the injured and the disabled and the, and the lack of effective, really, uh, employment and, and, and the dissatisfied youth and, 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 the, the, and, the, and the disparity in the, in the resources and on and on and on that can add on. But, but once we categorize these, we can hopefully get a perspective on how best we can help. I hope with that we can initiate a robust discussion and, and some ideas as to how we can move forward and how we uh, better see a, a smoother transition and a healthier development of a democratic Libya in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Assam, for this. It's a great uh, uh, introduction to our conversation that I would like to have here. It's a very interesting thing because Libya is very, very important, not just to the Libyans. I think uh, I just read an article a couple uh, yesterday, uh, just uh, was published by Rand Corporation, said Syria is trending toward the Libyan model. 
It is, uh, was published on February 14th on uh, Rand's website. I'm sure you guys can look at it. It is, it, is a, it will be a model, and I think it will be a model for, for, for intervention in the future, for global intervention and the rights for the United Nations and the global, econ uh, the global forces, the, uh, the world, to intervene to protect uh, human uh, civilians, uh, uh, the duty to protect that uh, Isam was mentioning. I would like to invite uh, uh, Hafid uh, to, uh, uh, to the podium here, <laughs> to the table, so he can uh, than add, him, uh, so I get to sit down. Anyway. <laughs> you get to sit down. There, uh, uh, Hafid will be uh, sharing some of his uh, insights and critiques uh, of the situation in Libya, and I'll be offering some, some, some suggestions for sure. What I would like to offer is just some observations uh, about not only what's going on and what is facing the transitional period, um, which is quite common. I mean, Libya is not a unique example in the world. The international community has very substantial experience in dealing with, with transitions. And there is no need to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, and I think Libya is actually, uh, under the right leadership, is in a unique position to capitalize on some of the international experience and use it to its advantage very quickly. But um, beyond what are the challenges, which are quite common. I mean, I was more of a negative person and quite frustrated a few months ago when I was seeing that this is going to happen and I felt nobody was paying attention to it. And people were just being very positive. And I was screaming and yelling in every forum I can, trying to sort of alert people to the train that is coming. And which was quite obvious, uh, maybe for me, because I work in, a, in an international organization whose business is to help in transitions um, in the world. So. Uh, now, I am not really um, negative, but what I would like to be is a little bit realistic. So let me start by the following kind of um, structure. The most difficult thing facing Libya moving forward, in my mind, um, fall under three basic general categories, <coughs> um, or whys, and, and that they need to be dealt with, not the pragmatic or the practical aspects of holding an election and so on, but why are we facing this kind of proliferation of militias? And the latest number, by the way, I heard that shocked me in, uh, uh, was that the militias around the country have reached close to 800, about 200 in Tripoli alone, which is an astonishing number. But why do we have this? And, and wh what's the, how do we get out of this? Um, there are three things. One is the issue of legitimacy. I think most uh, of these people, yes, you have some criminal elements, and yes, you have uh, groups who are actually former uh, members of the Gaddafi uh, 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 Revolutionary Guards and so on, who just simply changed the flag and decided to, to form a new militia, and some are doing it to rob cars and sell them through the borders and so on. So there, there is that element. But by large, the people who fought for this right now do not have a sense of legitimacy of the TNC or the government. And that, as Isam pointed out, is largely a failure of the TNC and of the interim governments because they should have prepared for this. They should have known this. And as I said, this is a very common experience around the world. It, it's not a surprise. It's not brain surgery to know from last March that this is what Libya will face when the Gaddafi falls. So I call it a self-imposed power vacuum because there was a lack of vision, a lack of leadership in understanding what's coming and preparing for it. And for example, transforming the TNC from this obscure, self-selected, vague, and defined entity into something more transparent, more modern, more uh, able to address people directly, which they still have failed to do. I mean, until today, we all know how many people are in the TNC roughly. We all know who they are. But it's not because of the TNC. It's because people are leaking documents or writing uh, lists, but the TNC never 
in a leadership kind of way, came out and articulated who they are, what their objectives are, how are they going about deciding things, how are they holding themselves accountable, and which is a very big thing, especially when you self-select yourself and people, in a sense, trust you with their destiny as a way of support. So legitimacy is absolutely essential to solving this issue of militias, of fragmentation, of people must believe that there is a legitimate authority or a process through which their aspirations, their dreams, their hopes, their complaints are being addressed. That's one. Second is the issue of capacity. And by capacity, I don't mean just people's skills, which is a big chunk of it, but other things. Libya has, I think, most Libyans know what the problems are. Most of them will tell you security is our number one problem, inside the country or outside. Most of them will tell you the first thing we need to do is disarm these guys. That's quite common. The question is, what is the tools you have to do that? So you have a lot of need, and it's actually quite uh, sort of agreed upon. But the country doesn't have the tools of government or the tools in terms of NGOs or whatever way you want to, or academic or and so on, to actually achieve these ends that they want to achieve. So the capacity is, is really important here. And I'll come back to it on the economic front in a minute. But I just want to lay out how I am looking at the, the issue. So we need to establish legitimacy. We need to figure out um, effective tools that we can use. Let's not just start sitting here thinking about, for example, we need an effective army, right? Okay, but why an effective army? An effective army for us is only going to help Libya defend its borders, <laughs> theoretically. And, but that's a foreign interest more than it is actually a Libyan initially at the moment. It's because Europeans don't want Africans running through. The reality is what we need is an effective police. Because when you have a strong army in the third world with no other institutions, you end up with a coup d'etat. So let's be very realistic and smart about how we want this to move forward. One of actually the, the advantages I see today is you have so many of these uh, militias because not one of them is dominant enough to take over by force. And, and believe me, this will be the easiest thing to do in Libya today given the vacuum you have. Um, so let's think through what is it that we want and what is it. So I think what we need is an effective police to, to, to create security in cities and so on. Army is a secondary layer to me. But so the second issue is the tools. So let's think through very clearly how we use the tools. Some tools we have, and they're not, tr they're not modern tools. I mean, we may not be great in doing conferences or you know, workshops for the larger majority of people, I mean, or modern tools of communications or so on. But you have traditional tools. You have tribes, you have local uh, leaders, you have, you, can, you have to be creative about using the tools you have, not the tools you hope to have. We need tools for Libya, not tools that work in the United States. That's the second um, issue. The third issue that I see as a fundamental problem is nobody now in the leadership positions, I mean, some are struggling to do that, but whether it's the TNC, whether it's the, fed, the federal government, whether it's the local government, whether it's any of the political actors, whether even the Islamic, sort of this vague, incoherent Islamic thing that we lump everybody, even though they are, there are thousand different Islamic shades, some of them are quite articulate and, and, and should be engaged. There is no vision. There is no narrative. There is no vision that is clear and credible that people can buy into. Everybody's talking about a democratic, civil Libya. What does that mean to the average Libyan, to the young people? What is it for them? How is this revolution change things for them? This undefined sort of higher goals are, are never good enough to get you there. You need people to buy into the vision of what it means to have a new country. So people have hopes in the future rather than rely on the human 
shortcomings we all have in every society where they're competing for petty resources. They need to buy into something bigger than them so they don't end up falling back on this kind of, no, I, you know, if I give up my weapon today, then I'm not going to get my job tomorrow or I, my tribe will be excluded and, so, and that kind of logic. So these are fundamental things. Legitimacy, which can only come by transparency in public life. There is no other way. Every dictator on earth tried to have a legitimacy in a different way. None can have it without <laughs> transparent, accountable governance process. And that should apply to the TNC before anybody else. And that includes legitimacy of, of justice process, legitimacy of the courts, legitimacy of even accusing. I mean, right now you hear people accusing this or that, Gaddafi, you know, uh, minister or the person who worked with Gaddafi or knew him or had coffee with him or crossed the street next to him. Uh, I mean, that's illogical. You need to have a real serious process. And then we're talking about the, capac uh, the, the capacity of the tools and then uh, 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 the vision, the narrative. Now, the second layer of this, uh, in my mind, is that, and this is no different from Egypt, Tunisia, Bahrain, Syria, or anywhere in the world, bringing down a dictatorship or a bringing down a, 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 a government does not solve your problems. It's at best, in the best of circumstance, it removes a key obstacle to identifying and solving your problems. Never gets you anywhere. The second is that, tied to this, is that democracy is not an end. We can't just be singing the praises of democracy. It's not a moral calling. Nobody came up with the logic of democracy because they are good, great, saintly people. It is a practical, fundamental tool to run public life. You know, a democracy, is, we are a society here sitting in this room. If we want to uh, agree on how are we going to function, how are we going to discuss, who talks first, who, that's something we need to figure out through a democratic process of agreeing among ourselves, implicitly or explicitly. Because that will show us where the problems are, and that is, will show us how we might solve them. Everybody today is talking about democracy. Unfortunately, in the way I see it, is that uh, people don't know. You ask them what is, re what is really democracy. I'll, I'll give you an honest, uh, a, a real story that is a joke in Libya. But it is a story It happened. One time in a, in a public gathering, and I went to Libya for the first time in over 20 some odd years, only last December. And there, were, there is a proliferation uh, of, of events and conferences and NGOs. And it's really quite heartwarming to see people, everybody is meeting or you are invited to this conference or that workshop every day. But uh, apparently one gentleman one day when they were talking about political parties <clears throat> and the need for political parties at Libya, he stood up and repeated, um, there is a line in the Green Book of Gaddafi which says basically that anyone who... Uh, becomes a part of a, of, of a, of a party, a political party, uh, has committed treason. And this gentleman got up and apparently he's a religious man, but not very smart one apparently or knowledgeable. And he stood up and he said, no, that's haram because the Quran says anybody who, who joins a political party is committing treason. <laughs> <So> <laughs> So, you know, so, so this, this kind of, um, you know, people must define what is it that they want in a democracy. I mean, a democracy can be a hundred different forms, a hundred different ways. It, you know, you can argue very easily, and, you know, academic literature is abound, that even tribal, even tribal meetings and structures are, are uh, 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 democratic in many, many ways. So how do we match the culture of the country and map it? to the democratic system we are talking about. I mean, in the West, it took five, 600 years to develop that system. I mean, and you can still even see some of the cultural, historic, very particular Western um, background to democratic process. I mean, in England, for example, I mean, when you talk about the House of Lords, it's because there used to be a time when the Lords are the ones who imposed on the king uh, the, you know, to accept that because they owned a lot of lands, they also ha should have a say in issues of taxation and so on. So they created the House of Lords. 
And then when the mercantile, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, um, renaissance happened and, and, and traders who didn't have land, but they had ships, had wealth, had a lot of money, why do these guys get to be a part of the political process? We're not. So you have a house of commons. And so it is a very particular reflection of a society of in the United States, the democratic process is also very much reflected in the decentralized federal system. You know, you have the local councils, you have the state, you have the, uh, uh, the national. There are very clear lines of how governments work. We should not copy a Western model. It will not work. That's why it didn't work when Mubarak claimed he had a democratic elections because there, were, there was no roots to it. You can't take that and create a system because it worked for the United States or Switzerland or England. It must really be a struggle. And that's why the process will take a long time. If we're really honest, to, we want to build a future serious nation. People must have enough security, enough legitimacy, enough, enough capacity to begin to debate these things and evolve the, uh, the, now. You will argue that the country can't afford that for very long, which is true. And one of the problems I have, for example, I think the most dangerous aspect of the militias is not really that they are there, but because they will dominate the political process. If we are Libya, and you guys have the arms, and these guys have nothing but their ideas, and we're going to sit down and hammer out a constitution, who do you think is going to win that game? So we have to really deal with the issues at, their, at the heart. Now, on the economic front, Libya has both Libya has a very good optimistic story, but it's also a very tainted optimistic story. And I'll tell you why. In, in, in economic development in general, um, most of the countries that are poor or they need development or they need help, usually it's because they don't have the resources. They don't have money. You know, African countries borrow or Egypt or, I mean, that you know, they want to build a power station or they want to build a whole new set of schools or hospitals or uh, they want to train their people in whatever um, area of government or healthcare or education, which the bank, for example, and the, you know, the bank mainly finances, the IMF finances the other issues. Um, and so they come to the World Bank or they come to private banks and they borrow that money and to, to build that. The problem in Libya is quite an opposite problem and quite a unique problem in many ways. Libya has the money, but it doesn't have the people. And I don't mean the numbers, I mean the quality of education, the capacity to build. So it's a, it's a unique development equation. So Libya can pay for anything it wants. The question is sometimes there isn't even the capacity to know what it wants or to identify what are the critical areas you need and how do you go about doing it in the right way through international standards of procurement, transparency, finding the right experts to do the training. And then if you do it through the private sector, you know, you go to a consulting company or something, you can do it. They bring people for you to do it. But it's not going to help you because they don't train your people while they're building a school system or you know, putting together the right set of curriculums or hospitals. Um, they'll build the structure. They will uh, 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 you know, give it to you, but it's not going to help Libya. So Libya needs to really begin, my feeling is moving forward. The country has a lot of goodwill internationally is a member and an owner of a lot of these international organizations where a lot of this experience resides, um, including peacekeepers and so on, and economic development, uh, judicial reforms, uh, health care reforms and so on. My, if I was the prime minister of the country, I would begin a process by which to enlist the international community and say thank you very much for helping us get rid of Gaddafi we, in turn, want to 
show our trust and rely on you to help us think through our problems and build a real viable country for our people. We need you to help us with examples. We need to help us with experts. We need you to help us with training. And we need to do this together because as uh, uh, Fadil and, and, and Dr. Isam also said, it's not just about Libya. You know, it's about the global peace uh, uh, and, and global international system. And I, I really believe very strongly that the Libyan people by large, if they are addressed honestly and truthfully and, be, and told really, look, here are the issues we are dealing with. We are in this ship together. Here is one way for us to go. There is no right way. I mean, it's a discussion. And here is what I'm proposing. I think the amount of support, just for the respect that they are accorded, for being told, being consulted, being asked, is in itself really a great demonstration. So these are just general observations. I have a lot of them. I'm struggling to write some of these down. Um, but I, I, you know, I am overall optimistic. I just wish for my country not to go through the pain that other countries have gone through to come out on the other side in five or ten years. I would rather if we come out of that on the other side in one year and do it effectively. Sorry, I took too long. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hafid. That was a great... Uh, 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 these are great observations, and I hope that we uh, can learn from. I would like to invite uh, uh, Karim for a couple of uh, minutes to uh, share with us some of his uh, observations, too. Sure. Um, I was very happy for, for what I've heard today, especially the idea that I think it is important that we project the future. Uh, it's fine to say there are problems, there are issues, but the most important thing that uh, both Isam and Hafez said is that we have to start thinking about what is going to be the country. Because we cannot stick to the, the militias, the disarm, the priority, fine, that's true. But once you talk about should, should we have an army or shouldn't we, is it dangerous? There's something that here people don't understand. Every, everybody saying oh, Libya should build up an army because the army is important. You send the army to call the militias. You send the, that is an, an incentive to two things. One, correctly, the possibility of a coup d'etat because the first general who's, who's, who gets enough soldiers around himself is going to say, well, that's not. Uh, let's let's talk according to different data, not the one you want. Or second, you go to, you, the army goes against the various the various factions and you start an, a, a, a really a, a civil war. Then in the case, so the the most important thing is, with the help of the international community, build up a police force. It should be reiterated, it should be constantly said, up and down, all over. Libya today does not need an army for Libya. You're right, it is the foreigners, it is the other countries, the neighbors who want an army. But the Libya, any money that is spent to the building an army and taken away from the building of a police force is a mistake. Second, and there's another very important point, it's, the, it's already passing by and we heard the people like Azza Mahur or another woman coming in talking about the federal government, federal system. You are right, it is very important that the Libyan people define what is Libya. It has not been said to today. I haven't read an article on a page or, or from the government or the ATNC who, who, who tries to fly high and say, for Libya, this is the mission, this is what is going to be. Is, we, gotta, we have to do the opposite of what has been done for 40 years, where the government told you, you are Arab, no, no, where the Arabs doesn't, don't love me, then you're not Arab, you're African, because the Africans love me, well, but you're African in the way I tell you what to do. And the Libyans are, are fragmenting, saying, well, well, what am I? And then all of a sudden, you are a, people, a man from Misurata, a woman from, from, from Zintan, because, because for 40 years and over, it has not been said. But let me tell you another thing, because I'm... Uh, uh, when we had to study Libya under Gaddafi, it was kind of boring. So there was nice, so we went back and studied the history. So I indulged a lot into the history of of the four, the thirties, the forties, and the period there. And the mistake was done at the roots of the way independence was made, because the, it was a compromise between the the, 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 the Tripolitania, the Cyrenaica, and the Fezzanese over a federal system, because that guaranteed the least uh, invasive form of government. 
but took away from the national identity construction exactly the, the terms that Hafez was mentioning before. Even the king did not project a vision for the Libyans. So the Libyans were left that when Abdel Nasser took power and Arab nationalism started spreading, the Libyans started talking about Arab nationalism, while the king was holding back and saying, well, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's pro-Western, it's uh, something else, something different. Even at that time, even, and that opened the door for the revolution the so-called revolution of Gaddafi. That, 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 that is something that in, in, we, we have the duty to repeat and say that we have to do exactly what you are saying. We have to project and say, Libya is, going, is this, is that, this is its identity, this is its national mission. Then we can start talking about the important issues, which are uh, uh, the militia, the money, the construction stuff. But if we don't start talking about this and we start stepping back and say, okay, we're going to have a local uh, federal system system of federal government, we are making the same mistake, which does not mean that the idea that you are talking about is not good, it's excellent. Local, local elections to build up the legitimacy of, of the system is a very important thing. But one thing is a local strengthening of local, of local forces. Another thing is talking about the, 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 the devolving all the authorities to the local. That would be a mistake. And that's uh, my two minutes of uh, trying to assemble. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Karim. Um, I'd like to open the uh, floor for, uh, for any questions or comments, please. Uh Hi, I'm Anna Newby with the Project on Middle East Democracy. I have a question about civil society development in Libya. Both of you mentioned that. Civil society development? W what do you think are the main obstacles at this point to the development of a healthy, diverse civil society in Libya? Are they mostly economic, political, related to security concerns? Uh, I'm Sahar Kamiz from the Department of Communication at the University of Maryland, College Park. And I want to thank the speakers for this excellent, these excellent presentations. My question is, what are some of the most striking overlaps and divergences between the Egyptian and, and the Libyan cases? And what lessons could be learned from each one to the other, if any? Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Leila Tayyib, and I'm a graduate student in New York. Um, and I want to ask if you guys would speak for a minute about um, the question of kind of Neoliberalism, each of you, especially the two first speakers, talked quite a bit about um, cooperation with the West and having kind of uh, technical advisors, experts, these sorts of things. And clearly it seems to me that one of the main parts of that project will be economic. And um, my own individual concern is not wanting to see Libya be like a Gulf state in the sense of being a place where um, uh, migrant workers have very few rights. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you hope for and are concerned about in that regard. I, just, I, I have a quick question about, um, ha, has there been any conversations about the redistricting of Libya um, to ensure that um, tribalism and identification with, um, you know, regions are, are like decreased? Um, you know, traditionally it's the Cyrenaica, Tripoltania, Fezzan, and then you have the individual cities and then the east-west and so has there been any, any conversations about redistricting for the upcoming elections? My other question dealt with um, some issues that Ustad Hafez mentioned, which was the um, uh, ins assurance that the, the NGO, international NGO help would not um, sort of um, marginalize the Libyans themselves. And has there been any conversa have there been any conversations about apprenticeship programs that ensure the training of Libyans in, in the process? Um, and, and finally, um, uh, you know, a lot of these conversations that we've had, certainly with Ustad, uh, sorry, I missed your first name, Karim, um, uh, uh, the idea of, um, you know, uh, uh, some of the issues, some of the issues that you brought up uh, about the history and not repeating mistakes, all of these conversations normally take place among the intelligentsia of, of the Libyan community and, and uh, efforts to bring these conversations to the Libyan people, um, uh, certainly through maybe in, uh, initiatives like public radio or through journalists and, and, and civil, uh, civic society. Um, so bringing the conversation to the common man, not leaving it in, among, among the intelligentsia. Uh, um, the, the NGO question is, I, I think they're struggling with everything because there is no legal framework for NGOs in Libya. There is no clear mechanism of funding. Um, the old traditional mechanism of funding NGOs, which we call uh, a, a, the, uh, sort of the trust, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, the religious trust that they used to uh, give to a good uh, waqf, exactly, to to a you know a good cause was dismantled by Gaddafi a long a long time ago. So there isn't much in terms, but they're struggling. They're active. There are hundreds of NGOs announcing themselves every day. I don't know how many of them are going to survive, um, especially when they start having to figure out a way to raise money, which is not that easy, as you know. Um, so there is a big challenge, but at least the spirit is there, and I hope that will will address it. Um, the, the, uh, the second question about Egypt, I think, is is really important. I, look, uh, there is no real clear parallel because Egypt has a very different political, economic, social structure and has a weight to it and institutions and capacities and so on that Libya doesn't have. But I think where the important part is now is from an economic and even a political security point of view is that these new governments that emerged in Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, if they can actually begin to think through in a very logical, non-ideological, non nonsensical kind of way, how they can complement each other in some of these, especially economic areas. I think that would be a very smart way. Mm -hmm. Economic security, for example, you know, one of the most obvious things is the access capacity of skilled labor in Egypt, whereas in Libya you have very little, um, you know, from teachers and so on. How do you do that to help both countries? Uh, <coughs> there, there are a lot, and the World Bank actually has a very active program trying to convince the Arab world for the last five years that they must uh, cooperate economically and integrate economically in some sectors because otherwise alone they will not be able to solve their problems. Mm -hmm. And the problems, I haven't had a chance to talk about them, but the youth unemployment challenge alone in the Arab world mm -hmm. is just incredible in its, mm -hmm. its potential uh, impact. I mean, um, you know, Egypt and Libyans, on average, you know, 30% uh, are not, uh, are unemployed. They just graduated from college. They don't have a job. They can't buy a car. They don't get, uh, they can't buy a house. They can't get married. I mean, you can see the purification of that problem and how it undermines the entire security and economic structure of the country. Um, on, the, on your point about the Gulf, I spent two years in the Gulf, and I, I, I think your point is absolutely correct. I mean, I spent two years in Dubai with, with the Harvard Kennedy School. And even the, the Gulf leaderships have began to recognize this issue of the migrant labor force. I think by relying on international standards, I think Libya can do better. And I think we should... Uh, hold the Libyan government to the highest standards of human rights. I think that's our real absolute guarantee as, as a people, as, as, as Libyans. And that will include the, the human rights of migrant laborers into the country. Um, and not follow, at least, I mean, we can follow the Gulf in other areas which are good, but not on this issue of how they treat labor, um, foreign labor force. Um, the last question, I am sorry, I missed it. You asked, uh, you, the district, yeah. Um, uh, my understanding is they, they just simply said, uh, they, they set uh, some general numbers from the three sort of wilayat, the old wilayat, Tripolitania, uh, 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 South Fazan, and uh, Sri Lanka. And I think the numbers for this transitional um, uh, election or this, uh, this majlis that they want to elect, which is another problem. I mean, look, I, I don't. I don't have to go into it, but ask anybody who has ever organized elections. There are a lot of NGOs here in town. You can ask them. It is completely unrealistic what they're trying to do by June. It, it, it's just the, the problems uh, of how you organize an election are enormous in details. I mean, I know nobody thinks about the details, but for example, even they're having a hard time now distributing those $2,000 that they promised to each family because they found out that the documents that prove who you are, a lot of them are not there, a lot of them are f uh, f uh, forged and so on. So imagine just actually getting the IDs for people who should be either running for election or electing people. I mean, um, I think they need to think through the whole process and they really need, they need help. They need to get, rely on something like the, the uh, uh, UNDP, for example, um, to help them figure out how to do this election. 
recognize this and has attempted to extend the transitional period to address this? Well, I, I mean, if they, I haven't heard if they did. Um, you know, and, and if they did, they need to really be honest and come out and explain why, because that's the worst thing. Let me see that's managing. I'm, I'm done. I have a, yeah, I have just to, I want to address just one question. Half has addressed most of them perfectly. I have just one, which I think is very, 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 very important, is your last point. The fact that it does not spill over from the elite, where it's not even in the elite is talked about, the whole historical issue, the whole, the, the, what you are mentioning, so how to spill over to the people. It is one of the most important things that we fight for is that education. The kids have to have education. I have cousins who do not know the history of Libya to, to talk about the history of Europe or the America or the world. It has not been taught. The, 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 and we should learn from what the regime has done. It took education out as the first thing. Literacy is different from education. So you, you, I think that having all this debate spill over to, to, to the people, to the youth, to the, to the masses is the most important thing. Learn your history, learn who you are, learn what you do, and in that, learn how to think, and that is the best receipt for democracy or, or, or whatever you want to talk about. It's a very important point. Just quick closing comments. I mean, I think uh, as far as the questions and the nature of these questions that were there, I think one of the, if you look at the redistricting as an example, this highlights actually a, a big challenge because as they were trying to develop the law, they were unable to put all the important points in it. And then in the, when it came to bringing it down to uh, 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 even like a referendum, they got over 14,000, you know, suggestions on how to modify it. And then they went through changes. And then now in terms of it, the big challenge is really in the implementation. The reason I'm saying this is because as you start unfolding the process and taking on steps to move on to the next step, you will start seeing these things come up. You know, the bigger picture in the election process is, yes, we are looking for a united Libya, and so we don't want to, let's say, condone processes that will help further divide us. Well, you have to be realistic as well. You don't have political parties. You don't have a structure that will allow you to have an election about a national identity and about a country that, you know, we call our own. So you have to somehow let that process take, take root. And eventually, that's what they did. They, they did a mixed process. But ultimately, that mixed process, 120 of them will come through the tribal and, the, and the, you know, the local elders and the folks who have the money and all that stuff. So, and then you have restrictions that prevents everybody who's participated in the process to even be part of it. Okay, so what are you going to end up with? You're going to end up with a government, arguably, that is very corrupted and quite a bit undermined. And so where are, you, are we going to be back now, two years back? You know, so they put the 80 people who are in there who are supposedly coming from political parties. And one of the recommendations, i.e. maybe even restrictions, is that 50% of that will be women. So how, you know, we took away the quota. Now we added the 40 people who are supposedly not. That's, what, that's where that 40 number comes from for the ladies to participate or for women to be part of the process. So you've got essentially a society that is struggling also with the role. Of, I mean, all these issues were going to surface. And so what you need is you need a visionary leadership that is able to draw a bigger picture, like Hafid mentioned, but able to be dynamic enough to engage this process. Nothing we can do alone. We need the help. And, and we've got to be able to forge you know, this step. And it's a very dynamic situation every uh, step of the way. And I'll conclude by saying, you know, our dear friend, Dr. Paul Williams from the PILPG, he always says, beware of the internationals. I mean, he, th but that's a statement not to say that we don't need the help. But, but we've got to have the strength and the leadership from within as well that's able to make this be meaningful and, and, and helpful. So it's, 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 a, it's a whole dynamic that, that we really have to be very cognizant of. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Of course, when he said be aware of the internationals, he was talking about if they take over all the processes and the decision making and, and they're in the country, and then they will never leave. They'll just stay there <laughs> because that's what they do. But, uh, but if, 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 if the government in Libya and the people of Libya ch uh, choose to use the expertise and the tools and, and, and all the help of the internationals, and I think the international can be very helpful. I don't think Libya can do it alone, and I think the uh, United States is very instrumental in, uh, in helping uh, Libya. And I think it, this is one of the cases where you can have uh, uh, a nation building without having to spill any, any blood or any sweat or any treasure. It can be done by, by the Libyans themselves, but they need the guidance and the support. I would like to thank you all.